Welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host and author, Dr. Holly Thacker, and this is Chapter 3, What's to Blame, Age or Hormones? For women, it isn't always clear whether a specific health symptom, such as weight gain or hair thinning, is caused by aging, menopause, or another health condition. Many people, many women alike, blame menopause for what are either normal signs of aging or the results of another medical issue or lifestyle habit. So menopause gets a bad rap. In the following scenario, can you tell which of Ella's problems is actually caused by menopause? Ella. Okay, so I'm menopausal. I can deal with that. The hot flashes aren't too bad, and I actually like not having periods anymore. Ah, but my skin is getting wrinkly and crinkly. I'm losing my hair, and my doctor says my blood pressure's up. Even worse, when I laugh or cough, my bladder leaks a little. (gasps) It's embarrassing. Are these mere symptoms of menopause? If they are, sign me up for hormone therapy because they're driving me crazy. Because of the uncertainty of what actually caused a problem, many people, men and women alike, readily blame menopause for what are either normal signs of aging or the results of another medical issue or lifestyle habits. So menopause can get a bad rap. Signpost on the road. Our bodies tend to send us reminders that they need attention, particularly if we're not taking good care of ourselves. If you slack off on regular exercise and healthy eating, Well, your cholesterol and blood pressure may soar. If you don't get enough sleep or do enough stretching, you might feel irritable or feel stiff. Maybe you're unable to think of the right word or remember where you put your keys because you're tired, distracted, or just simply trying to do too many things at once. These signals often hit at the same time as menopause cues, such as hot flashes and mood swings and skin changes. But For the reasons the signals aren't always clear, are they age-related or due to menopause? It's like a traffic jam. You're not sure whether you're sitting in bumper-to-bumper traffic because of an accident up ahead or be simply because everyone left work at the same time. Of course, our bodies don't always produce change in a way that lets us deal with one problem at a time. This explains why so many women come into my office feeling completely betrayed by their bodies and asking such questions as these. Why did I put on 10 pounds when I'm just as active as I was when I was 25? (gasps) I haven't changed my eating habits. Why is my cholesterol high? How can I control my blood pressure when my job is so stressful? Teasing out symptoms of menopause from aging or other conditions is not always easy. I usually start by explaining to my patients what I call the target zones, the places where age and menopause often converge. Before we can treat a specific target zone, we need to find out what started the war. A sometimes complicated process. Your target zones, where age and hormones intersect. Several areas in the body are affected by both aging and hormonal influences. So let's examine those, as well as effects from both aging and hormone loss alone. Eyes. Age. There is a reason you remember your grandmother peering through bifocals as she read the newspaper, and you've probably noticed that your glasses prescription does not improve with every successive visit to the eye doctor. The explanation is purely scientific. The lens of the eye located behind your cornea loses its flexibility as we age, causing a decrease in our ability to focus on very small print. Because of this, even those who started of us who started out with 2020 vision will eventually be reading, reaching for our reading glasses, even sooner than those of us who started out nearsighted. Hormones. Well, your cornea reacts to rapid shifts in hormones, and they can occur when you're pregnant, using birth control pills or other hormonal contraception, or even menopausal hormone therapy. The diameter of the cornea changes with hormonal fluctuations, and the shape of the lens depends on how much water it contains. So this all can affect your vision and focusing. 
it really is best to avoid having any laser LASIK eye surgery or getting fitted for contact lenses or glasses, even when your corneas might be under the influence of marked hormonal fluctuations. Skin age. Well, the sun is the main offender when it comes to skin damage. Over time, sunburns, visits to the tanning bed, and disregard for sun blockers contribute to solar aging, resulting in the loss of elasticity and the appearance of wrinkles. Compare your face to less exposed areas of your body, and you'll find smoother skin. You know what I'm talking about. Toxins such as cigarette smoke can also age your skin significantly. In other cases, simple genetics and darker skin tone explain why some women look younger than their chronologic age. Hormones. Consider a pregnant woman whose skin is glowing. Hormone levels are high at this point in her life, but with the dramatic loss of hormones comes loss of collagen and the connective tissue in the skin responsible for its elasticity and resilience. Collagen gives skin that dewy plumpness. Some women experience as much as a 30 to 40% loss of collagen within five years of menopause, their final menstrual period. Research shows that estrogen clearly helps maintain collagen levels, and women who do choose to take hormone therapy may report less aging in their skin. But this is, of course, not the sole reason to, to talk about beginning hormone therapy. And we're going to talk a lot more about beginning hormone therapy in Chapter 5. Hair. Age. At least 40 to 50% of women lose some hair or notice hair thinning as they age. Hormones. Hair loss can worsen with lack of estrogen, as well as the increased sensitivity to existing testosterone based on lower relative estrogen levels as you go into menopause. Skin, hair, and nails are all affected not just by hormones, but also nutrition and your genetics. Heart rate. Age. You can pump your legs just as fast on that walk today as you did when you were 22 years old, but your heart rate won't climb as quickly or as high as it once did. It's kind of an ironic rite of passage that we have to work harder to increase our heart rate when we get older. As with age, our maximum heart rate does decrease. Hormones. Well, estrogen affects the electrical cardiac rhythm. In general, women tend to have a slightly longer QT interval on their electrocardiogram tracings and are more predisposed to so-called falsely abnormal EKG stress tests. The QT interval is a measure of the time between the start of one wave, the Q wave, and the end of another, the T wave, in the heart's electrical cycle. Most important, women are more likely than men to experience adverse disturbances to their heart rhythm when they take certain medications. In fact, most medications that have been taken off the market because of heart rhythm problems were disproportionately problematic for women compared to men. One example of that in the not too distant future uh, past was Seldane. Cholesterol. Age. While cholesterol may or may not increase with age, it's mostly determined by genetics, diet, and lifestyle. But... If your weight and diet change change as you gain in years, your cholesterol will almost certainly rise. Hormones. Estrogen does improve the cardioprotective so-called good HDL cholesterol, and it helps keep the so-called bad LDL cholesterol in check. Loss of estrogen in some women, with all other things held constant, such as diet and weight, may cause cholesterol levels to worsen. If a woman gains the infamous menopausal 15 on top of the freshman 15 of her college days, as well as the mommy weight she might have acquired after having her babies, she can easily slip into elevated cholesterol, elevated blood pressure, and even diabetes almost overnight. Metabolism, age. By midlife, few of us can get away with drive through dinners, late night eating without tipping the scale. As we celebrate more and more birthdays, our metabolism naturally slows. Simultaneously, we tend to lose muscle mass, and since muscle mass helps burn calories, our bodies must work so much harder for us to afford any little extra portion of food or even a small dessert. 
hormones. Whether you're naturally menopausal or your ovaries were removed through hysterectomy, you are likely to notice an acceleration of loss of your muscle mass. And the only way to combat this is with weight-bearing exercises such as strength training, which will help maintain muscle mass. You can do this. I know many women in midlife and beyond who are actually stronger and in better shape than some 20 or 30-year-olds. <clears throat> is it true that hormone therapy will make me gain weight? Well, this is a common myth. No, you will not gain weight by taking hormone therapy. In fact, women who take hormone therapy are actually less likely to gain weight than those who are not on any hormone therapy because they maintain. We'll be back after a quick break. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG, and we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or go search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. lean muscle mass. Some women on hormone therapy occasionally lose weight, but just a pound or two, and this is no reason to begin hormone therapy. Women who gain weight on hormone therapy generally are neglecting proper nutrition and exercise unless they're simply reporting water weight gain. Higher doses of estrogen can promote salt and water retention. In some women, this can be easily managed by restricting salt intake, reducing the estrogen dose, or occasionally using a diuretic. If you maintain a healthy lifestyle and choose to take hormones, you should not notice weight fluctuation. As an aside, one thing I recommend for the vast majority of my midlife women, since menopause is essentially an anti-aging field without all the extra snake oil salesman aspects to it, because women who take hormones generally live a few years longer and have reductions in several disease burdens, intermittent fasting is fabulous and it is anti-aging it reduces insulin levels and if you're not pregnant or a growing child or someone who has you know some medical issue by restricting uh, the time that you eat i think most adults should consider intermittent fasting and we have a multitude of articles about weight loss about intermittent fasting different ways to do it on our speakingofwomenshealth.com website. So getting back to age versus hormones, we're up to bone mass. We rapidly make deposits into our bone bank during adolescence, which explains why it's so important for our teenage daughters and sons to drink milk rather than to switch to soft drinks. We actually continue to build our bone mass up until age 30, even 35 when it peaks. But from then on, we generally cannot accrue bone mass. We only gradually lose it. Hormones. At least half of all women will <clears throat> lose bone at a rapid pace after entering menopause. And much of this has to do with family history and genetics. Also, if you weigh less than 127 pounds and or smoke cigarettes, you're much more likely to be diagnosed with low bone mass, also called osteopenia. This is a condition in which there's decreased bone mineral density. This can be a precursor to osteoporosis, which is a much more serious condition in which bones become brittle and can break, sometimes without even any significant trauma. Most women who suffer from a broken bone after age 40 actually have osteopenia. And osteopenia with a fragility fracture equals clinical osteoporosis. So both require treatment or at least something preventive. And in chapter 12, we'll talk a lot more about bone health. Are there any conditions solely related to aging as opposed to hormones? Of course, <clears throat> some health conditions are simply age related. Just as certain parts of a car wear out or need a tune up after a while, certain body functions sputter when we hit midlife and our personal maintenance light switch goes on. The following are some changes to watch for. <clears throat> kidney function. Think of the kidneys as your internal cleaning crew. After years of working overtime, 
especially if they've been stressed by symptoms of high blood pressure or diabetes or medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, they're kind of getting tired. Actually, even starting as young as age 30, there's a very slow decline in kidney function and how our bodies process and remove raw waste. Most of us don't recognize any problems because of the cleaning crew still doing its job. Bone loss. You can get calcium from foods, soy, dairy products, greens like spinach and broccoli, even fortified bread, cereals, even fortified orange juice with calcium. But unless you drink a glass of skim milk three times a day, it, it might be slim that you're meeting all of your calcium needs through food alone. Now, there is many other low-fat dairy products, yogurt, cottage cheese, cheeses, ice cream. So there is a a variety of delicious ways to ingest calcium. To maintain current bone mass, women ages 30 and older generally need 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day, in addition to at least 1,000 international units of vitamin D3 each day. Vitamin D is even more important as you get older because the skin doesn't convert it as well. It's very important if you avoid sun exposure and are not drinking cod liver oil, which has both vitamin D and the real vitamin, vitamin A. And we did a podcast earlier on vitamin D and the importance of this. The farther north that you live, the latitude is such that even if it's a sunny day, like it's a sunny day right here where I am recording this in Cleveland, blue skies, uh, but you can run outside naked and you're not going to make vitamin D in your skin. Not in February. Unfortunately, as people age, women over 55 don't, especially if they're not on estrogen, their intestines are less able to absorb calcium. And some postmenopausal women without calcium intake need to ingest even 1,500 milligrams of calcium daily and may need to up their vitamin D from 1,000 to 2,000 international units. This can be monitored by your physician checking your 25-hydroxy vitamin D level which has to be over 32 for bone health. And for general health and immune status, I like to see a level of around 50 to 60. Still, some women who get the proper amount of calcium and vitamin D can still lose bone rapidly after menopause. Women that may have a family history of osteoporosis, hip fracture, dowager's hump, or height loss, having low body fat or current or past eating disorder can reduce your bone mass. Diet and exercise regimes can be a factor. Both a history of kidney stones, because some people excrete too much calcium in their urine and that can lead to kidney stones and broken bones, or those that have a history of wheat or gluten intolerance, such as celiac disease, can all reduce the intestine's ability to absorb enough calcium, vitamin D, and iron. And this can affect bone health. Smoking cigarettes is another harmful factor. Of course, if you smoke, quit, like now. And please talk to your physician about devising an anti-osteoporosis program that takes in all your personal risk factors into an account. And we will be discussing osteoporosis and bone health in much greater detail in chapter 11. I'm sorry, chapter 12. Fast fact. When considering how to take your calcium, keep in mind that your body can only absorb about 500 milligrams of calcium at one time. Like a sponge that gets saturated and can't take in in any more, your gut gets saturated with calcium. So don't take all 1,000 milligrams to 1,200 milligrams of your calcium all at once because you'll be wasting some of it. And anything more than 500 milligrams will not be absorbed. Blood pressure. Rising blood pressure is something that many women and many men have in common as they age. Blood pressure generally steadily increases in adults, particularly between the ages of 35 to 55, and might might continue to rise thereafter. As mentioned earlier for women, blood pressure should be about 115 over 75 or less. Bladder control. Mm. Losing control over your bladder is no laughing matter, but laughing as well as sneezing, coughing, jumping, can unfortunately trigger stress urinary incontinence accidents in many women as they get older. The medical term for leaky bladder is urinary incontinence. 
so-called stress urinary incontinence occurs involuntarily with laughing, jumping, or coughing. Urge incontinence results from the type of overactive bladder that wants to just empty as soon as you feel the slightest urge. It's as if your bladder's got a mind of its own. Some women have mixed incontinence, which is both stress and urge. Stress urinary incontinence, or SUI, is usually related to lack of support of the bladder neck muscles. It's worsened with weight gain, constipation, childbearing, chronic cough, enlarged uterus, and women on very high doses of hormone therapy can have a slightly larger and heavier uterus. And you might notice worsening of stress incontinence if you start on hormone therapy. If you have stress urinary incontinence, you might try inserting a supersized tampon into the vagina to see if it reduces the leakage. If this helps, it usually means your bladder neck needs additional support. And there are effective therapies from Kegel exercises, reducing constipation, chronic coughing. Sometimes collagen injections are done, specific uh, pelvic stimulating devices to cause the Kegel stronger than you can, pelvic physical therapy and bio feedback, and even sometimes surgical repair procedures with slings are needed. There is an over-the-counter, um, it's like a disposable pessary called Poise Impressa, and it comes in three sizes. Uh, it just has to do with the firmness of the insert. It's kind of inserted like a tampon, but it isn't a tampon. It's not absorbent. And obviously, you wouldn't want to put it in a vagina that's very thin and dry from untreated menopause, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, or vaginal atrophy. But uh, this can be like a temporary Band-Aid and uh, might uh, temporarily help you. If you have urge incontinence or overactive bladder, you need to see a doctor and have a spot urine test to exclude bladder infection, bladder abnormality, and then a post-void residual bladder scan by ultrasound to see if you have any leftover residual urine in your bladder after emptying it. We like to see a number less than 50 cc's right after urinating. Sometimes women have to double void and relax to clear out their urine. Sometimes the urogynecologist will say, if you scan your bladder and then you can at least empty two thirds of it, they'll accept that as being okay. But I'm always happy when I see zero cc's, meaning you've completely emptied your bladder. If both of these tests are normal, the urine dip in the office and the bladder scan, Your physician or nurse practitioner might advise you to avoid bladder irritants like caffeine, alcohol, acidic drinks, carbonated beverages, artificial sweeteners, spicy food, bladder retraining, and so-called, quote, timed voiding, as well as keeping a journal of your food and drink intake and the number of times you urinate might be very helpful for you and your doctor. There are several prescriptive overactive bladder medicines, such as oral uh, tilteridine tartrate, also known as uh, Detrol. There's Enablex, the brand name for Dara Fenison, Sanctura XR, Trisperinine, Vesicare, uh, Solafenison, Succinate. And there's also an oral or, and patch form of Ditropan, uh, the generic name being Oxybutynin Chloride. And uh, there is over the counter Ditropan. But these overactive bladder medicines shouldn't be taken if you have any acute angle glaucoma. And they have anticholinergic side effects, which means they can cause constipation or dry mouth. Uh, there's also a newer agent, um, Mervetric, Trisperinum. If one agent doesn't work or causes dry mouth, then sometimes I encourage patients to try another agent. As some women respond better to one agent than another. A red flag. Involuntary leaking of urine is not a normal part of aging. And it's not a normal part of menopause either. So if you start wearing a pad or liner because of leakage, if you're afraid to jump on the trampoline with your grandchildren or go to a funny movie with your girlfriends for fear of bladder leakage, please see your physician, your women's health clinician, or even a urogynecologist that specializes in bladder leakage. And before contemplating surgery, be sure that you've done bladder retraining, that you've treated any infection, any vaginal atrophy, that you've optimized your health, that you've done Kegel exercises or maybe been referred to a physical therapist who can instruct you on Kegel exercises. 
So Kegel exercises. I think all women should do Kegels, 20 to 25 repetitions every morning. Do them standing up, maybe when you brush your teeth and floss. Because most of us don't forget to, blo to brush our teeth. But unfortunately, a lot of women forget about their pelvic muscles. If you're unable to do Kegel exercises or, or, or are unsure how to do them, ask your physician, physician assistant or nurse practitioner to instruct you how to do a Kegel during a pelvic exam when the examiner with gloved um, fingers can examine and detect the pelvic tone and pelvic support. There are some women, even athletic women, young women, people in the healthcare profession who understand anatomy and physiology who actually are completely unable to do Kegels, unable to contract their pelvic muscles properly, and actually need to be referred to a female physical therapist who can specialize in the pelvic floor and use biofeedback techniques. Muscle rehabilitation and pelvic biofeedback can be used to improve problems with muscle tone. Now, for very mild cases of mixed incontinence in women that have a very thin, atrophic, uh, delicate vagina from lack of hormones, for many years I have used uh, the string. That's a brand of estradiol vaginal ring. It's a silastic ring with natural estradiol in it that is inserted into the vagina and leaks out a tiny bit of natural estrogen just to the vagina, not to the uterus, not systemically. And the physical aspects of the ring kind of give a little bladder uh, neck lift. And improving the health and integrity of the vagina is also very helpful. And I found this along with Kegels and avoiding constipation and some bladder behavioral retraining very helpful. Lack of local estrogen can affect not just the vagina and the base of the bladder, but also the urethra. And it can make it the bladder more likely to be irritable and susceptible to infection. Conversely, systemic hormone therapy might increase the size and weight of the uterus, which can put some pressure on the bladder. Bladder control relates to many factors, muscles, nerves, the bladder lining, hormones, supporting structures, supporting musculature. And unfortunately, like we've discussed, we all lose muscle mass with age. The pelvic muscles called the levator ani muscles support the, bladderus, uh, the bladder, uterus, top of the vagina, and the rectum. It's the muscles that you consciously contract to stop the flow of urine, stool, or gas. And these are the muscles that involuntarily contract during sexual climax. The same pelvic muscles can be damaged during pregnancy, childbirth. They can be strained with weight gain and aging. And if you don't exercise the pelvic muscles, you lose strength. Which is why for almost all women, unless they have incredibly high pelvic tone and vaginismus, I usually recommend that women practice the Kegel exercise. Is it age or menopause? When I can't separate menopausal symptoms from age-related changes in my patients, the best course of action is to try a low-dose regimen of hormone therapy to see if it resolves the problem. If it does, we pretty much know that the symptom was indeed menopausal and hormonally related. For example, if I prescribe hormones and my patient finds that her hot flashes are reduced, she sleeps better, she feels less anxious, then her symptoms were probably menopausal, and we can adjust the hormone therapy as necessary. If her symptoms are not re resolved, uh, we suspect that there's another cause that has yet to be found and treated. As for Ella, remember Ella? We described her at the beginning of this podcast, in, of this chapter. I explained to her that her skin and hair problems were most likely related to menopause, but that the rise in her blood pressure and the embarrassing bladder leaks were probably related to lifestyle, genetics, and age. So I offered some tips for dealing with skin and hair problems at midlife, and stay tuned. We'll go into that in chapter five, and I'm sure I'm going to probably have some additional podcasts to talk about skin and hair. Ella decided to try some alternatives to hormone therapy and see whether her symptoms improved. So we decided to work together. She was going to keep her blood pressure within a healthy range, performed a urinalysis pelvic exam and bladder scan to see whether there was any residual urine in the bladder after voiding. I referred her to a urogynecologist, which is an OBGYN surgeon who specializes in both the medical and surgical treatment of bladder leakage in women. Brain fog and other memory problems. 
memory difficulty frequently rounds out a suite of other menopausal symptoms. And women who have hot flashes and sleep loss often say they struggle to find the correct word or they just don't feel like themselves. They aren't just absent-minded professors. Their thinking is not as sharp and clear as it was. A lot of women come in and they simply describe it as, quote, brain fog. If this sounds familiar, you're not losing your mind. And most likely, you're probably not developing Alzheimer's disease either. Sandra's story. It's like a fog, a haze that settles into my brain like a cloud. I'll be explaining to my husband some event that happened during the day, and then I'll just blank out on a simple word. I just dropped Michelle off at the day camp and her her, her teacher, my husband, will fill in, nodding to me to tell him what happened next. It's so embarrassing. Nowadays, I feel as if people must think, huh, Sandra's losing her mind. Some days it does feel that way, but I'm sure every working mother of two forgets where she is or what she's got to do sometimes, right? We have so many places to be and so many things to do. Ah, But I am getting worried because my mother had Alzheimer's. Come to think of it, nearly every woman in her nursing home had that blank, far-off stare. It really scares me that I may... We'll be back after a quick break. Have you ever experienced fitness failure? You know, you set a, a goal to exercise, you're all excited, and then you're not. Hi, I'm Dave. I host the daily 10-minute podcast, Walking is Fitness. Instead of an exercise goal, I talk about making a fitness promise. And every day you keep that promise, you add another link to a growing fitness chain. This is a podcast of action. You'll create a fitness habit, which eventually becomes fitness momentum, and then on to all kinds of good stuff. Check it out. Walking is fitness, and let's take a daily 10-minute walk together. Be following in her footsteps. Perhaps you can relate your brain fog to the same hazy feeling that some postpartum women experience after delivery. Oh, I remember after I had my first son, I couldn't even write thank you notes for baby gifts. I couldn't even spell simple words like where and when, duh. And that's because hormones fluctuate rapidly and plummet after giving birth. The sudden inability to recall simple facts or information, like the spelling of simple everyday words, can happen when estrogen levels drop extremely low. Because you see, estrogen is brain food. And dipping levels of estrogen, whether from having a baby or going into menopause, can affect brain function in some women. And then, if you throw in sleep deprivation and hot flashes and night sweats into the mix, along with other medical changes that occur at midlife, well, you can see why you've got a recipe for your brain not functioning on all cylinders. It's common, it's normal, but it's frustrating. And please don't let it scare you. Well, how do I know that it isn't Alzheimer's? Here are some facts to ease your concerns. If you struggle with memory blips, as I call them, people with Alzheimer's or senile dementia of the Alzheimer type are not so aware of their condition that they actually recognize it and tell their physicians. Many times the first signs of Alzheimer's is forgetting how to perform simple regular activities like driving home from the store or carrying out simple motor functions. And the medical term for this is apraxia not simply fumbling for the correct word. Rarely do adults in their 40s and 50s have Alzheimer's. Generally speaking, people who suffer from this disease are much older. And the good news is, is that brain fog that accompanies midlife can be treated, and further memory loss may be prevented by stimulating your brain on a regular basis. Can hormone therapy help relieve my memory problems? Sometimes hormone therapy can be used to sharpen memory. Observational data from a study in Cache County, Utah, suggest that hormone therapy at midlife might protect the brain from memory loss. 
But the researchers are careful to note observational data are not grounds alone for solely prescribing estrogen for this purpose. We do know in a lot of basic science research that estrogen is very important for neuronal health and supports acetylcholine function. In the Cache County study, women who began hormone therapy at menopause and continued it for 10 years developed Alzheimer's at half the rate of women who never took hormones, which is similar to a man's risk of Alzheimer's. And as you know, men don't generally lose their constant source of estrogen, which is from testosterone. So we can deduce from this research that taking hormone therapy around the time of menopause, especially if taken for a decade, uh, can be helpful in uh, preventing memory loss. However, as with any prescription medication, every woman's case is unique and must be examined thoroughly. This information is not definitive, but it's very provocative. And I wouldn't tell a woman to take hormone therapy solely to reduce her risk of Alzheimer's down the road. But if she's suffering from memory complaints around the time of menopause, and I can't rule out other causes like thyroid disease, vitamin B12 deficiency, depression, sleep apnea, well then I would definitely recommend a trial of hormone therapy for at least three to six months and then reassess her status. And if she responds and she thinks she's thinking much clearer, then I would keep her on therapy and reevaluate her annually. If she doesn't show any response, then I would send her to a neurologist for more formal neuropsychiatric testing. So what else can I do to keep my memory sharp? Well, through a fascinating study of aging nuns called, appropriately enough, the nun study, we're learning more about what factors in early, mid, and late life increase the risk of Alzheimer's. Funded by the National Institute on Aging, this longitudinal study began in 1986 as a pilot study on aging and disability. It used data collected from the Order of the Sisters of Notre Dame living in Mankato, Minnesota. In 1990, the study was expanded to include school sisters living in other United States regions. There were 678 participants ages 75 to 103 years old, with an average age of 85. And you may recall that one in two women by age 85 have memory loss. So this group represented a wide range of health and levels of functioning. More than 85% of the women had been teachers. All agreed before joining the study to donate their brains to the research effort after their death. Results show that some nuns in the study who lived to be more than 100 years old still retained their intellectual faculties, even though they had evidence of Alzheimer's plaques in their brains. The researchers discovered that this group of nuns had stayed quite engaged mentally by learning new languages, or they wrote in their journals, they participated in mental workouts, they exercised their brains, and they stayed sharp right up into their last days. So this link between mental activity and a decreased chance of Alzheimer's is a very important finding with implications far beyond the convent. In my opinion, it certainly points to a definitive role for brain exercise. Use it or lose it. Brain boosters. If your job is left-brained, relax by performing right-brained activity. For instance, if you work with numbers, like as an accountant, in your spare time, do something physical or creative. Go for a walk, read a novel, take up ballroom dancing. However, if your job is right-brained and creative, say you're a writer, then you might want to stretch your analytical left brain, play some chess or Monopoly or bridge or do crossword puzzles. Now, we know that even if you're not in paid employment, all women work. So the trick is for women of all ages to engage and challenge both the right side and the left sides of the brain. Whether you work in an office or you're caring for children or grandchildren or volunteering in your community, try learning a foreign language or maybe try to learn how to tango dance. Read and write. Try journaling about happy things you experience from day to day. This will help both your brain health and your mood. Okay, enough of the bad news. Please highlight this part of the chapter and read it out loud and make it your anthem. Or 
you can just repeat after me since this is a podcast. Midlife is not the beginning of the end. Repeat. Midlife is not the beginning of the end. It's the beginning of the best years, which are still to come. We mature and change, but many women feel most comfortable in their skin during midlife and beyond because you've acquired wisdom and experience and perhaps a little more confidence and your perspective and skills are sharpened. Perhaps some nagging symptoms or body changes have inspired you to clean up your act and start taking care of your body. And as a result, you may feel better than ever. Please remember, you're in control. There are solutions and options for you as your body experiences a new phase in life. And only the very rare woman says she regrets the absence of her monthly periods. And please remember, it's never too late to adopt healthy habits for the rest of your life. Exercise is truly anti-aging. Midlife can be the perfect time to reinvent yourself, learn a new skill, renew some old friendships, and begin some new ones, as well as make new spiritual and or career connections. Remember, the more you know and the more you can control your own vitality and health. Thank you for joining me in the Sunflower House. And I will be back with Chapter 4 on maintaining mood at midlife. So please be sure to subscribe to our podcast on any of the usual channels, Apple iTunes, Google, Stitcher, radioinfluence.com. 